Hello, and welcome to the IEEE Spectrum Online presentation, The Evolution of 5G and Current Releases of GPP Standards and Its Impact on Testing. This is the second webinar in our webinar series, The Road to 6G. I'm Dexter Johnson, and I'll be moderating this presentation. Before we start our presentation, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you who are using Chrome and Edge browsers, if you have Flash blocked, please click on the play button on the media player. Uh, if for any reason you have some difficulty seeing the slides or can't see the video that might be playing of this presentation or have some issues with your audio, just try refreshing your browser. This will fix just about any issue you may be having. For those of you who want to know if this session will be archived, the answer is yes. It will be archived and will be available for review within about 24 hours. And once the archived webinar is available, a notification email will be sent to all the registrants. Today, uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, we encourage questions from the audience, so as your questions occur to you, please type them in the Q&A box provided on your computer screen and hit the Submit button. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to begin submitting your questions. If you are looking for the PDH certificate code, this will be given in a slide at the end of the presentation. As you look over your screen, you should also see buttons allow you to enlarge the slides if you want and about volume control. If you're listening to the audio over your computer speakers, you may have to adjust the volume on your computer. Um, at the bottom slide in front of you are a couple of additional widgets that will improve your uh, viewing experience, including a green resource page uh, with today's uh, PDH certificate code form and uh, today's presentation in a PDF format. Now I would like to introduce our presenter for today, Kevin Ramdas. He's the director of Telecom Train and program head of wireless telecommunications at Humber College. Kevin has been leading a leading expert in the field of telecommunications for the last 20 years and has been on the forefront in the evolution of connectivity from 2G through to 5G. Kevin is actively involved with helping companies test and solve issues with communication products, platforms, and processes. He has also developed many courses to help professionals learn the foundations of telecommunications. He's a member of the 5G Council of Canada, Tech Nation, formerly the Information Technology Association of Canada, and the Institute of Performance Learning. And with that, Kevin, I'll hand it over to you if you'd like to begin. Thank you, Dexter. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this seminar, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, IEEE Spectrum for hosting and, and Ritsu for, for sponsoring the seminar. So let's go straight to the agenda. So the plan for today is that uh, we're going to talk about uh, a few 5G concepts, mainly about what is, what is 5G, looking at the different frequency ranges and so on. And then we're going to look at measurement challenges. And so when I think about measurement challenges, I always like to, in order to do really good measurement, it's, it's essential to understand what it is you're measuring. So uh, when we go through this presentation, the idea behind the presentation is to give people, give, give you a really good idea of what's happening in the technology in the background so that you can make appropriate measurements and decisions uh, in the future. As you leave this presentation, I'm hoping that you, you, you've got a couple takeaways to f help form your thinking. Uh, one, uh, I'd like you to have a, a, an understanding of the different types of measurements and in which state of the system you're, you're conducting those measurements. Um, OTA, uh, over-the-air measurements, or passive or active measurements, or so on. And the second thing that I'd, I'd like you to take away is how, when we move on to 5G systems, that there's a slight decorrelation between the quality of the pilot signal and the actual performance of the system. So, 
uh, in the previous generations, 2G to 4G, you can measure your pilot, get your signal to noise ratio or your RSRP or whatever the equivalent is, and then you can have a general idea of this is how my system's going to operate. Uh, in the future, in this next iteration in 5G, uh, because of beam forming and massive MIMO, that not, won't necessarily be the case. So let's go on to the presentation here. So uh, I got this slide, this uh, picture uh, in, uh, from LinkedIn at the beginning of the month. And you see this, uh, this, uh, design, this site design here. And what do we notice with this site design? So really what we're seeing here is a, a telephone pole, a three-sector antenna, and, and what's going on here. So some of the questions traditional uh, telecom people might be asking is, where are the radios, the cabinets, the power supplies? You don't see any of that. All you see at the top of the tower is one or three active antenna units. Secondly, look at where those sectors are pointing. Any RF engineer that's in the audience would be like, whoa, 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 this will not work whatsoever. So the, the sectors look like they're pointing in trees. So, I mean, for RF engineers, they would look at this and it would be like their worst nightmare. Uh, working with RF, though, uh, you never know exactly. You have an idea of what's going to happen, but it's a little bit of magic, a, a little bit of art, and a little bit of science to kind of figure out what's going to happen here. But uh, the question that we're left with is, is this a bad design? And so this is this is why we need to have a pretty good understanding of measurement and test in order to see is this a bad design and my answer for this is that i don't know i don't know if this is a bad design it depends upon what our results are from our test and measurement and what were the aims of this of this site all right and so uh from for, for this pre, for this presentation i'm going to focus on 5G systems from the network test perspective, from the carrier perspective, and, and what needs to happen in the network test. All right, so let's see. All right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> with 5G systems, we've got uh, different applications that are going on in, in the system. So uh, I, I'm sure many people who have been following along with 5G thus far have an idea that there are three major uh, outcomes of it. One is enhanced mobile broadband, uh, which is just means high-speed Internet for, for customers like you and me. There is ultra-reliable, low-latency communication. So generally what we're talking about is uh, things that require low latency. So that might be industrial, IoT, or virtual, uh, augmented reality, or some sort of healthcare applications like remote surgery or something like that. And there's massive machine type communications which require a very dense device, uh, device density. So. So now we're looking at maybe, a, I think the stat is, uh, the, what we're looking at is a million devices per square kilometer. So when you look at those three things, uh, there's a lot of conflicting requirements for the 5G system that produces challenges in design. So uh, how do you address power consumption? How do you balance power consumption and low latency? those two things don't really work well because you, if you want things to respond quickly, then you need to be on all the time. And so there's a, there's a balancing that, that needs to happen. Or having peak speed versus the number of devices. So really, when we look at 5G, we're seeing that we're creating a system that is based on flexibility. And it can be implemented in many different ways. So 
you know, when you talk about flexibility, there always becomes complexity. And so then uh, we're, we're seeing all of this, and it's going to be able to service so many different verticals. So prior to this, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, we pretty much had one, maybe two verticals. We had con consumers. That's our one, con our one vertical. And the second part was maybe we got, had a little, we had some IoT going on in there. But then now when we're looking at 5G, now you've got verticals in, in industrial, you've got verticals in vehicle, vehicle to vehicle communication and vehicle to infrastructure communication. You've got healthcare verticals. And so then now you've got the system that needs to be flexible to deal with all of your different verticals. And so as a result, uh, I think one of the things that we're going to see here, and I think if we've been following the news over the last uh, month or so, or year and a half, to even up to this last month, is that we're going to start seeing a lot of non-telecom entering the, the market. All right. So then the other part of this, this, uh, this picture here is, is our frequency ranges. So then we've got low-band frequency ranges. So let's say those are sub-3 gigahertz. Uh, those are very uh, familiar with the telecom carriers. And, and that's usually used for coverage issues. Then we've got mid-band, and mid-band is where a lot of the magic, 5G magic is going to happen. And uh, those are made for somewhere in between that, uh, somewhere in between there where we're going to start getting our 5G type capacities. And then there are the high-band frequencies. Those are, our, uh, we're calling it FR2 frequencies, a millimeter wave frequencies. And those will be made, will be used in hotspots. All right. All right. So just to look at our frequency band attributes here. So when we're looking at low band versus mid band versus high band, uh, low band is what we're familiar with. It's giving you coverage, mobility, reliability. Notice that the amount of bandwidth available in the low band is low in comparison to the mid band and low in comparison to the high band. So as we look at, at bandwidth, and when we say frequency bandwidth, it, there's a there's a one to one a one to one, uh, a one, -to -one uh, coupling between bandwidth and and speeds you can get out of your out of your system. So the more bandwidth you spectrum bandwidth that you provide, the higher speeds you can get out of your system. So now in low bands, the amount of available bandwidth is pretty low. In 3.5 gigahertz range, that mid band range, uh, we're going to start seeing we're going to start seeing higher bandwidth available. Uh, right now. Uh, I, I'm based out of Canada, so I follow the Canada, the Canadian market a little bit closer than what's going on. So in in June of this month, we we started the Spectrum auction for 3.5 gigahertz, and then I, I think it was last week they there's been a, a postponement of it. So then now that's pushed back to December. So then now when we're talking about uh, 3.5 gigahertz and those bands being auctioned off and being ready to being used by the telecom providers, what, time of, what kind of timeline are we talking about? We're talking about a timeline at the end of this year. So this is 2021. So at the end of 2021, we're going to see, we're going to start seeing uh, 3.5 gigahertz and those mid-band frequencies coming out. And so then when the telecom carriers start implementing in, in the 3.5 gigahertz range, that's when 5G channels are coming out where you're going to see a definite advantage, a definite performance uh, difference between, between uh, maybe you'll start seeing a lot of marketing campaigns saying, my 5G is better than your 5G uh, in, in going into early 2021. And then when we look at the high band frequencies there, uh, we've got larger bandwidths, up to 400 megahertz channel sizes. Um, but then the, the problem with the high band is that you've got uh, 
relatively poor and relatively unknown propagation characteristics, which will limit the size of our cells to tens of meters, maybe up to 100 meters or so. So, And then usually we're dealing with line of sight or some version of line of sight, uh, of direct reflection or something. There's a lot of innovation happening in and around that uh, high band and near millimeter waves. So then when we're looking at some of the bandwidths that we're talking about, just to give you some comparison so you understand some of the numbers here, LTE had a maximum band uh, carrier of uh, 20 megahertz, 5G NR FR1, um, which is our, our um, sub-6 gigahertz, so that's including our 3.5 gigahertz. So those band channel sizes are 100 megahertz. And in FR2, the high band, we're talking about 400 megahertz uh, channel sizes. So so let's look at what these frequencies mean because there's one thing to just say these numbers of 20 megahertz, 100 megahertz, 400 megahertz, and another, and of sub-3 gigahertz, 3.5 gigahertz, and millimeter wave. But let's see what that actually means for, for understanding what's going on here. All right. So when we're talking about wavelengths that are uh, that are available, that that when we're talking about 700 megahertz, what wavelengths are we talking about? So you can just use your your speed of light equation there, and you can do a quick calculation. And 700 megahertz, that wavelength is 40 centimeters. So I want you to picture this. So 40 centimeters, if you were to hold your arm out right in front of you, it's, I don't know if my arm's long or short, but from my elbow to my fingertips maybe is around 40 centimeters. I'm estimating. I hope my estimation's okay. And then if I was to talk about 3.5 gigahertz, if I was to hold my hand as wide open as possible, uh, maybe from my thumb to my pinky finger, that would be 8 centimeters. And then when we're looking at 28 gigahertz, we're talking about the width of maybe our fingers, let's say, right? So then now why is that important? Why, is, why are those wavelengths important? Um, so what I'd like you to do is visualize what a wave looks like. So like if you're holding your arm out at 40, uh, 40 centimeter wave going through the air, that's taking up a little bit of space. And what does that 40 centimeter wave look like in the environment? Can it bend around things? Can it go through things? It's kind of, think about it as if uh, you're an ant versus a human walking down your driveway. So as a human, you're kind of, it's, it's nice and clear, easy to see, no impediments. But if you're an ant, there's a lot of little impediments. So size really matters when we're talking about, about these kinds of sizes. So at 28 gigahertz, there's a lot of impediments around. And when you hit a surface, there's a lot of scattering. When, when you're 40 centimeters and you hit a surface, maybe there's not that much scattering in comparison to the 28 gigahertz. All right, so those frequencies act, behave very, very differently in, in when it's out in the environment. Second thing to note here is that path loss is proportional to the inverse square of the wavelength. So then as we go up into these uh, smaller wavelengths or higher frequency smaller wavelengths, uh, we're getting a lot of path loss. So then, so then when we're looking at 20 gigahertz, again, I mentioned that our cell sizes are going to be limited to tens or tens up to 100 meters. And then the other big thing about this is that whenever we look at an antenna element size, that's approximately lambda by two. So every time you, when you have uh, any sort of antenna element, and uh, uh, an antenna would be made of many elements, but the basic antenna element is lambda by two. So then when we're talking about uh, millimeter wave uh, at 28 gigahertz, those antenna element sizes are very small, half a centimeter, as opposed to, let's say at 3.5 gigahertz, we're talking about four centimeter uh, sized antenna elements. 
All right. So So I'd like to look at this uh let's break up our types of measurements into two types of measurements. There's conducted measurements versus OTA measurements. And so back in the day, we used to have a radio at the bottom, coax at the bottom of the tower, coaxial cable running across the bottom, across and up to the antenna, and then the antenna. So then when we used to do OTA measurements, we would have access to the radio and be able to measure the output of the radio. We'd be able to sweep the cables to see if, make sure that the cables were okay. And then we'd be able to look at the antennas and see if the antennas are okay. So then now we can break down the system and test each component of the system out in the field to say, are these components okay? Uh, and so we used to do that with the conducted measurements. Uh, however, there are over-the-air measurements and uh, sorry, with, the, with respect to the way that these cell sites are, are evolving, we're seeing that uh, the RF components and what we'll see is that the radio will be directly integrated into the, into the antenna unit, and we're going to talk a lot about that in, in the rest of this talk. But uh, what will end up happening is that that ability to do conducted measurements is disappearing, and it's leaving us primarily with over-the-air measurements, which means that we're doing radiated measurements. So we would need an antenna or uh, connect to the spectrum analyzer, or a cell phone connected to a laptop or a channel scanner, connect, whatever that, that situation looks like. Um, so let's look at some of these, these measurement issues. So measurement issue number one, uh, access to the radio and the antenna. We won't have any more access to the RF path. And so why is that happening? Uh, we're uh, we're going to, in this talk, we're going to talk about beamforming, MIMO, and massive MIMO, and how, what is happening in the transmitter and the receiver and the RF path in order to, to make those things happen. And then if you have a good understanding of those technologies, and that's my goal here, for you to have a good understanding of what is, what are these things and how are they implemented and why is it impossible to have access to that RF path then, and how they're going to behave out in the environment, then you can make your own decisions about uh, about what are challenges when we go out to measuring, measuring, uh, doing any sort of measurement. All right. So then, cell site evolution uh, on the far left there, we had the radio at the bottom, antennas at the top, connected with coax. We can do measurements at the radio, measurements at the coax cable measurements of the antenna. Then what ended up happening is that we said there's too much loss in the RF path, so let's maybe move our radio head to the top of the antenna and top of the tower. Uh, that's one thing. And then two, we started putting out uh, MIMO signals, so multiple in, multiple out signals into our antennas. And so then we're going to see in a, a little bit that if we want to have MIMO signals there, we need to have phase makes a difference. So as soon as that signal leaves our radio, uh, we need to maintain the phase of our signal to go into the antenna because as soon as we mess around with phase of our signal, then we're, our signals are going in the not in the right direction that we want it to go into. So. So anyway, at the top there are phase match uh, cable, coax cables, and as opposed to m many years ago, we used to have technicians or installers putting on field terminating those cables. That no longer can happen. You have phase match coax coming from the manufacturing and the manufacturing plants and tested, and then installed for that specific installation. Again, the radio is at the top of the tower. It's a lot less accessible. Uh, than what it used to be. And uh, the, that interface that connects the, the rest of the radio access network is from the BBU to the RRU or the RRH using fiber and the SIPRI interface. Um, and that's a digital baseband interface. And we're going to see that, that term, digital baseband, which is really we're talking about a SIPRI interface. 
And then in the third round there, we've got a massive MIMO antenna. So this is what we're going to be seeing here, where the radio is integrated right into the antenna. Uh, and we're going to look at we're going to look at this from two different perspectives. Um, for perspective number one is how does MIMO lead to this? And then, which is looking at that air interface when it goes out and radiated air interface. And then how does beam forming come into this? Because when we look at a massive MIMO antenna, we're looking at beam forming and, and MIMO happening in the same, at the same time. So they're kind of working together. They're different things working together to create a massive MIMO antenna. So in the early days, I'm just going to go through some signaling history. So you had single in, single out, line of sight connections. You have a transmitter, sends a signal over their interface, goes to the receiver. That's, that's pretty nice. Easy to, easy to go. Then we look at our RF path. So then that first diagram wasn't super uh, accurate because our RF environment is pretty chaotic. You've got a lot of things going on there. You've got path loss. You've got multi-path effects. And when you have multi-path effects, then, then your signal is delayed. You've got versions of your signal coming to, to your receiver. So, like, imagine sending – so, let's see. You've you got scattering effects, refraction, diffraction, reflection, Doppler effects. All these things are contributing to your RF environment. So, now, when you send a pulse – suppose you were to send a pulse from your transmitter to your receiver, what ends up happening is you've got multipath. So then now instead of receiving a pulse, you're going to get a little bit of something called delay spread. So then now that pulse is starting to, to uh, spread out a little bit. And then you add in, you add in different components of multipath. And then you add in your path loss. And then you add in uh, scattering and refraction, little signals from here and there. And then you also add in noise and interference. So then now, by the time your signal goes from your transmitter to receiver, it does not look at all like the signal that you sent. So how do we deal with that? That's, a, that's the question here. So um, we kind of deal with it in, in, in we take ma many different ways to deal with it. And, a lot of different ways have to do with diversity and building diversity in their system. Um, but really, let's, I'm only going to talk about one type of diversity, and it's going to be received diversity, and then we're going to talk about transmit diversity in, in a little bit. But uh, there's coding diversity and uh, frequency diversity. There's a whole bunch of different things that you can do to make that RF path of better for you. But so then uh, we add diversity to our system. So then what you see here is that on our on our receiver side, maybe we might have two antennas, and then you put some sort is called re receive diversity. And generally, when you've got that, you you have to combine the signal somehow. And so uh, it's the same signal coming from the transmitter going to two different antennas. Those two different antennas need to be spaced out, uh, or or it has to have some sort of independent paths to them, so they need to be spaced out a little bit. And then the two signals should have different paths to it, and you need to combine the signal at some point. And so there are a couple of ways. You can take the best signal. You can take the compare the signal-to-noise ratio and then to take some ratios and then combine it. So there's a bunch of theories about how you combine things. But anyway, that's what, ha that's what happens on the, on the MIMO, on the receive side. But more so to decode our signal, um, more so to decode our signal, what we do, and these, this diagram I, I, I pulled back from my GSM days, because uh, you, ha you would have data, and then inside each of your, your, your air interface uh, packets, I guess, uh, there's a training sequence in there. And that training sequence is a known bit, uh, a known bit pattern that the, that the phone would know. So then the phone would receive that training sequence, train the DSP within the, within the phone, and it would make a decoding matrix. And that decoding matrix would be applied to the data. 
And as a result, you can take whatever mess that the channel has provided for you and the decoding matrix and the training sequence and the DSP will do the inverse of that channel mess. So then, so then it, it removes the effects of the channel when, when we do this, this process. Uh, notice that in this situation, all of the computing complexity is happening in the phone. All right. So we can start talking about what MIMO is here. So that now, really, when we're talking about MIMO 2 by 2 MIMO, we're talking about one user. The one user has received diversity. You can now send two different data streams as long as the two different data streams are independent of each other. So then you can, so then what does independent mean? It means that if I was to look at, well, maybe I'll define orthogonal first. So orthogonal that means uh, at right angles to each other. So then like if you were to talk about orthogonal signals in, let's say if you had things that you know that are orthogonal easily are an X and Y coordinate. So if I had a, a point and I put a, I put a point out in, in, a, in a Cartesian coordinate system, you'd be able to say this much is from X and this much is from Y. So then if I put a, a dot there, you're able to distinguish what, how much is of X and how much is of Y. And the reason why we're able to do that is because X and Y are orthogonal to each other. And so uh, this is the idea between orthogonality. So there are different ways of building orthogonal um, components or things. So then in this case, in this case, we can possibly make our signals look very different by using um, orthogonal polarization. So, so then our data stream one can be sent out in uh, minus 45 degree uh, polarization versus uh, data stream two would be sent out at a plus 45 degree uh, polarization. And so then those two paths now that go to the receiver are independent of each other. They don't look at all like each other. So then as a result, uh, we're able to transmit two data streams to our MIMO receiver. All right. Um, so now we had this problem in, in our previous slide there where the transmitter, the receiver needs to do all the decoding. So to solve some of this problem, uh, we switch over who does the decoding. So what will end up happening is that uh, we change our, our structure so that the, the UE, the user equipment, now sends channel feedback to the, to the base station. And it says, hey, I, I'd like you to make this a little bit more independent for me, a little bit more orthogonal for me. And the way that you can do this is by doing this. And then it'll send something something to the to the base station and it'll make a pre coding matrix. So then now as the before the 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 site sends out the two data streams, it'll apply a pre coding matrix to those streams and then and then what ends up showing up at the phone are is two different independent signals that work well and it's able to decode and a lot of that processing power is removed from the UE over to to back to the base station. So then now from there we go on to multi-user MIMO. So multi-user MIMO actually doesn't increase the amount of bandwidth available to the system, but it allows multiple users to access the system at the same time. So we might have data stream and da data stream one and two going to user one and data stream three and four going to user two. I could have easily drawn this diagram to go data stream two, three, and four going to user two and data stream one going to user one, depending on the needs of user one and user user two, right? And so when we say data streams, now you could think about one coax cable connecting to an input of, a, of an antenna. That's a kind of, you've got a, receive, a transmitter chain that is connected using a jumper, right? So that's, that's what I'm referring to as a data stream. 
All right. So then now um, we did, haven't talked about beamforming, but we're going to talk about beamforming quite a bit in a second here. So in here, uh, instead of sending it just to one antenna element, uh, we achieve beamforming by having a phased array of, of antennas. And we're going to talk about what that really means in a second. And uh, in there, we've got uh, several, each data stream will be sent to a phased array. And then as a result, we can beamform signals to individual users. So this is the idea of multi-user MIMO. And the other thing to realize there is now you can support two users at the same time. There's lower latency. And also, if you want to have more users, remember that when we use any of these systems, we're using OFDMA. So I didn't really describe that already, but um, that's our multiple access scheme. So then you can accommodate a lot more users, if we're use, especially when we're using OFDMA. All right. So, and then when we take this one step further, uh, our data streams, are, we can get to massive MIMO. So we're, this is approaching massive MIMO from the MIMO perspective. And then we're going to approach massive MIMO from the beamforming perspective, because we're going to have to put them together to get this. So that now massive MIMO could look something like this, where you've got a whole bunch of these orange antenna arrays, they shouldn't be just four, maybe a, 16, a 4 by 4 or 16 by 16 or something like that antenna array, and each one of those will have a data stream, and each one of those data streams can be aimed at our users as needed. I, I didn't draw my error interface yellow arrows because it would be a little bit too chaotic in, in this diagram. All right, so let's talk about beamforming. So, um, so we've got a single dipole. Um, what ends up happening there is that, uh, that it looks like a donut. So when you look, the radiation pattern looks like a donut. So from the top, it's all around in a circle. And from the side view, it, you, that's what you see. Um, a two-element array, uh, what ends up happening is if I feed in the signal into the same phase, the, the signal coming out of each element of the, of the array, they add in phase directly ahead, and we get a gain of 3 dB um, and a little bit more directive of a beam. A four-element array, again, what we're doing here is, is as we add elements, those elements will add uh, all those signals from each of the elements add in phase in a specific direction. Again, aiming a more directive beam. So then what are we seeing here? We're seeing that as we add more elements to our antenna, we are leading to a more tight, more directional beam. All right, so then now let's do a little thought experiment here. If we were to adjust the feed length, uh, feed length going into, uh, let's just say this two element array, Let's, let's think about uh, the signal traveling down these lines. Um, the signal will, receive, will get to that first, that bottom uh, antenna first, and so it'll start radiating before that second, and that top antenna. So then you notice the, the two circles that I drew there, uh, one smaller than the other. The reason why is because it hasn't had a chance to, to uh, get out there. So to have the equal phase, it's a little bit behind a little bit. So then now where does the equal phase constructive thing, uh, constructive interference happen? It happens at an angle now. So then as I made that feed length into that top, top element a little bit longer, what I've done now is I've now directed my beam. I've changed the direction of my beam. And so this is a very common way of doing electrical tilt or remote electrical tilt or something like that. So you can do that. So what have we established so far? We've established that more elements equal a tighter beam, and we've established that uh, if we control the phase going into each one of the elements, we can control the direction of the beam. 
So then now let's take that even a step further. If we were to have a two-dimensional array and we were controlling the phase of all the signals going to all of the all of the different elements in the antenna array, uh, we can control the beam as it goes. We can control it to go up and down and left to right. So we've got a two-dimensional control of of um, of how our beam can be directed. So then, now we talked about phase feeding in, and now this is just one last thing here. This is a, it's not really a side note, but it's a, it's a interesting part of this because now when we, what I didn't draw in those diagrams, in the original diagrams were the side lobes. And so side lobes are, are, are radiated power in directions that you don't want it to be radiated in. So if you want to reduce your side lobes, when you're feeding the signals into the array elements, you can, if you adjust the amplitude of each of the feed signals, you can start, you can start reducing the, the side lobes of, of your, your antenna. So then now, remember, we're think, after this, we're, we're thinking about measurement. So how is it going to be all affected by measurement? So, um, so really, where, where have we gotten to? We've gotten to, we've got these, these antenna arrays. And if we control the phase, we can direct it. And now if we can control the amplitude going into each one of the elements, we can reduce the side lobes. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking this is amazing. This is, a, this is, this is amazing how it, how it all works. So then now um, when we go to analog beam forming, um, let's say for our LTE system where we've got a, a data stream coming in, it goes through a digital baseband. So our digital baseband, let's, let's picture that as SIPRI. At the front end of our RF transmitter, there's a, um, a digital to analog converter. And then that digital to analog converter goes through an RF chain. So we're adding in our, our intermediate frequencies, our power amplifiers, and all of that kind of stuff. And then our RF chain feeds it into a splitter, goes into a phase shifter because the phase shift controls the, the phase, the direction of the beam. And now we've got this, this idea that if we control the phase in that phase shifter there, that we can control the direction of our beam. All right. So then our next step here is a digital beam forming. Um, so we controlled we controlled our in that previous diagram. Sorry, let me just go back to it. In that previous diagram, we we controlled the phase going into each element using a phase shifter, which is just a circuitry. Now, in digital beam forming, what we can do is now the digital baseband. We can say, all right, well, let's control the amount of power coming out at each one of the that's feeding each one of them and we'll control the phase so then coming out of our digital baseband now we've got this pretty uh, amazing uh, processor that's now controlling the amount of amplitude that's going to be fed into each one of our antenna elements so then now coming out of our digital baseband that's controlling our phase and it's controlling our amplitude, and it's showing it's uh, it's feeding each one of the antenna elements. Now the problem is uh, I, I I'm not a I'm not a, a power amplifier designer, but the the problem with with having digital baseband digital beam forming at a, at multi uh, millimeter wave frequencies is that the power amplifier is not very efficient. So now the idea is that you come up with something called hybrid beam forming. And so we've got a digital baseband. It feeds uh, four different now transmitters, and that's going to feed one antenna, uh, one antenna array. And so now you've got a uh, digital baseband to do macro control of the beam and, uh, and an analog beam former to do micro control of the beam. And so then now when we take this onto a MIMO antenna, 
where you've got a whole bunch of subarrays in one panel. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of digital baseband's with a whole bunch of RF transmitters, which are connected to a whole bunch of, of analog phase shifters. And so then now think about think about what, where how many jumpers do we need now? How many jumpers do we need to connect our our, our all of these RF transmitters to each input of our analog phase shifter connected to uh, it's now it's incredibly complex. And then you also have so many different RF transmit chains. So then now that's a that's that's our uh, that's what our MIMO antenna looks like. So then, uh, just going back there, that's what the MIMO from the MIMO perspective is. But now, the going back to our measurement issue one, what does the access to the radio? Do we have access to the radio and the antenna? Now that the now that the RF in our MIMO antenna, that our massive MIMO antenna. The, there's so many different RF transmitters connected to all of these, maybe 128 or whatever number of antennas. Then it's. I, I'm hoping that you're starting to see that it's almost impossible to to have antenna ports for each one of these, and that it's it's almost impossible to have access to each one of these radios because you want to have it light. You need it at the top of your tower. All of that kind of stuff, and and so we won't have access to the radios and antennas, in and when we start rolling out massive MIMO. All right, all right. So we're going to go on to our measurement issue two. Um, this one won't take as long to to cover. So Dexter, you, you don't you don't need to worry about my time. I think I'm doing okay. All right, so. Uh, measurement issue two uh, is spatial dependence of our measurement. And so let me just talk a little bit about uh, OTA measurements. Um, OTA measurements, we've got a couple different types of OTA measurements. Um, when you think about this, you have a device, you're over the air, and you can your, your device, your UE, can either be in reading the control channel in idle mode, or it can be in connected mode. And so then when we're looking at our, our 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, what ended up happening was that your beams that are coming out of the, the system in, in 2G, 3G, 4G, 4G uh, too, um, the the pilot signal is coming out of the same antenna setup as your connected signal. And so then when you make measurements on your connected, on your idle um, signals, control channels, then you can make some sort of uh, correlation that those things, that they're, they're about the same. However, when we're looking at 5G now and we're looking at what beam forming is, uh, your control channel will not have the same beam pattern as your as your as your control channel. Your con in connect sorry, I don't know if I said that properly, but the connected mode beam patterns will not be the same as your idle mode beam patterns. So then now that's a completely different signal. So then now. The idea between passive measurements versus active measurements. Passive measurements will read your control channels, and so that's great. You need this because you need a, a passive measurement that will decode. You can see the pilot signals. You can see if you do some signal analysis and decode, you'll see the site configuration, what, it, what, is, um, what is enabled. Is it communicating that DFS is avail available, dynamic spread spectra, spread Spectrum sharing is available. Is carrier aggregation available? And all of those things you can see that from from the from the idle mode calcul measurements. However, on active mode, this is where where things are going to go different. So, uh, just go a couple of these 5G concepts. We've got carrier aggregation, where you got LTE base stations. Uh, back in the day, you you can send. 
uh, 20, not back in the day, probably today, you can send uh, multiple frequency bands to increase the speed that you're able to deliver to the UEs. So instead of just sending one, one band, you're sending multiple bands. And so passively, you can see the site configuration. And if you want to see the actual performance due to it, you need to do actual uh, active measurements. And so remember that when we're looking at any of this, we're talking when we're looking at the carrier perspective. All of this is um, about about user experience, right? And so, what does that look like to the user in terms of latency and throughput? So, fi other five G concepts. There's non standalone that's being rolled out right now, and you can see that the phone is talking. Uh, doing control through the LTE base station, and there can be data channels going from LTE or 5G through the L some version of this where the 5G system gets out of the system, the data channels go get out of the system, either through the LTE base station, uh, ENOB, or directly to the EPC. I think that's just a matter of IP addressing or tunneling properly. So then now we've got this idea of dual connectivity carrier aggregation. So this is why we have this 5G NSA, the non-standalone, is because now we can possibly have carrier aggregation. And so when we're talking about carrier aggregation for 5G, I think this is where you're going to start seeing a lot of the performance gains for for 5G because uh, because this is where perform because this is where the 3.5 gigahertz band is going to Roll out, and then you can aggregate the 3.5 gigahertz bands in and around this using dual connectivity carrier aggregation. All right, let's see. What's next here? All right, so how does the pilot's channels work? I've got three more slides, I think. Four more slides. Um, so in LTE, you've got a pilot channel. It it gets radiated out here. I think I actually measured those 120 degrees there. So anyway, anywhere you measure, anywhere you measure, you're on the same beam, um, and you can pick up your synchronization channels. Um, in 5G NR, what ends up happening is that it uses beam forming, and it goes and sweeps each one of those beams. Uh, every it, it, it's variable, but it, I think 20 milliseconds is the is the accepted number, and so that's what the, each one of those beams or SSBs will have a it will have the system information on it, and you can take some measurements of this to see what's how your 5G site is configured. However, uh, in order to in order to do any sort of measurements in the uh, performance. Um, that radio environment will look a lot different because now when you're looking at that active channel to the UE, it might be a much skinny. That diagram here that I have here, it's supposed to be a much skinnier beam pointing to pointing to the UE. And so, anyway, that's what I was trying to illustrate. But uh, that that beam is not the same as the beams that are being put out by the pilot. In the by the pilot channels and the SSBs, and so, so then now, uh, that's our problem. This is our challenge. There's spatial dependence of our measurements when we're looking at 5G. So, um, there's going to be a big difference. There could possibly be a big difference between what you get, what you pick up passively, versus what you pick up actively. Um, so, <clears throat> anyway, from where we are are right now, I'd like to. I think what the, when we look at all of this that I've covered here in a jam packed 55 minutes, uh, I just wanted you to take away a couple things from here. Um, one, the different types of measurements and in which state it's conducted. So, like o conducted measurements versus OTA measurements. And when we have OTA measurements, uh, the difference between passive measurements and active measurements, and then how there's a key correlation between the quality of your pilot signal and the actual performance of, of your devices out in the field. Um, as we 
So, and let's see, anything else? I think I think I've hit my I think I've hit my points here. So, uh, I'd like to thank you. And uh, and at this point, Vex, you're going to take it away. If you'd like to connect with me, uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation in whatever form you would like. Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, let me just put out this PDA. H uh, certificate code. Uh, I think some people are looking for that. Um, yeah, one question that uh, we we had was uh, as the mid band is being rolled out now and in the near future, what are some of the challenges that we're going to encounter with with that rollout? Okay, um, challenges with mid band. So we're talking about the three point five gigahertz band there. And so uh, those those spectrum auctions are happening in Canada, happening in December, I imagine. I think that's – I didn't look at the date. But really, these are, are frequency bands that we don't really have that much experience with. So telecom carriers have worked uh, sub-3 gigahertz, and then now we're going to 3.5 gigahertz. And so one of the, one of the issues that uh, – it could possibly happen is that we don't have a real good understanding of the propagation qualities of uh, 3.5 gigahertz with respect to penetration and how it will do um, in in different environments. Um, the second thing that that's happening here is that um, the 3.5 gigahertz bands; those are all TDD. So that's another thing. So there's we've got this this issue of um, knowledge and and experience. So we're lacking, lacking it in terms of in terms of TDD because a lot of our our systems thus far have been SDD, especially in North America, and so then now we're going to be switching, making that switch over to time division duplex. So then we've got to have there will be some issues with seeing interference and 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 looking at our at our signals from 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 a TDD uh, perspective. And so maybe we might need to be looking at um, real-time spectrum analyzers. And so that's new equipment that, that some people may not have had experience with. So there's some things along with respect to that. Okay. Okay. Um, great. Um, so um, another question, what role will interference play in 5G? What role? Um, yeah, that's a that's a, a good question there. Um, so, in terms of in terms of um, what role will interference play? So, when we're looking at interference, uh, the noise floor as we go from 3G to 4G to 5G, we're looking at lower and lower noise floors, and so. Now, we, there, there's going to be, uh, and especially when we're looking at 3.5 gigahertz, these are new bands that were previously used for other, other technologies. And so then there's going to be a lot of work uh, coming up to clear the spectrum. So then there will be a lot of drive testing and interference testing to, to roll out your, because you need a clean RF environment in order to roll, it, roll out your 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 system so so that's uh, that's one of the big things so there'll be a lot of pre-work to clear out the clear out the spectrum okay I think we have time for one more question uh, what are the benefits of passive OTA measurements as it relates to measuring QOS and QOE for consumers benefits? well number one I guess when you're looking at at passive uh, over the air measurements um, what your there are different purposes so i wouldn't say that you'd be using uh, your passive measurements to be measuring quality of experience for your consumers you'd probably be using uh, passive measurements to see what your site configuration is to see w whether or not you've got coverage you'll be using that for for oh, pretty much site configuration. Is, is the site saying what it's supposed to be saying? And can can our devices connect with that? Um, 
But then when we start looking at Q, Q quality of experience, um, now that's all in connected mode, and now you've got beamformed signals going to it. So then those passive measurements don't work, won't get that, those those directed beams at it. So then we're not going to see that same that same kind of uh, uh, correlation as what we had seen before. I hope that helps. Okay, great. Um, well, we're out of time. Uh, as I indicated earlier, this session will be archived in about 24 hours. And once the archived webinar is available, a notification e email will be sent to all the registrants. Um, I'd like to thank Kevin for making this such an informative hour, uh, our sponsor, and thank you, our audience, for participating in today's session. And we hope you found today's event valuable. And we'll return for future IEEE Spectrum Online webcasts. Thank you. Thank you.